Within 25 years, human beings will fly out into space and land on the moon. Man will conquer space. The Johns Hopkins Science Review, presented by the Johns Hopkins University and WAAM in Baltimore. This is the Johns Hopkins University, famed for 76 years for its contributions to learning and scientific research. Here in the many laboratories, Hopkins scientists are probing into the secrets of science, which, when discovered, will be translated into benefits to be enjoyed by you, the people of America. Each week, we are privileged to look over the shoulders of today's scientists and catch a glimpse of their research. On this, our 178th showing of the Hopkins Science Review, we present the first episode in three programs showing how man will conquer space. To introduce this program on space travel, here is Lynn Poole of Johns Hopkins. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Johns Hopkins Science Review. You know, everybody all over the country is talking about space and space travel, and I thought you might like to see this issue of Collier's Magazine, which has an article about space travel, a trip to the moon, by one of our guests who will appear with us next week. I also would like to thank Collier's Magazine for loaning us some of the models that we're going to show tonight. Now, those of you that were with us last week know that we went up through the 120 miles of our Earth's atmosphere and pierced outer space. We found out about this great, vast universe that was around us. We saw some of the dangers that might lurk out there for men who were going to travel in space. The cosmic rays, the ultraviolet rays, the meteors, the comets, the lack of oxygen. And we saw that man will experience a very strange thing, weightlessness. He will float about helpless in space. Well now, the next step on our trip to the moon and the conquering of outer space is the problem of how we're going to get there. Well, of course, astronautical engineers all over the world are working on this problem. They know many facts. They know what rocket propulsion is. So let us find out just exactly how a rocket is propelled. And we have as our guest the chairman of the Department of Aeronautics at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Francis Clauser, to tell us this. Mr. Poole has asked me to come down from our aerodynamics laboratory at Johns Hopkins to tell you a few of the interesting things that aeronautical engineers and scientists are doing to make space travel possible in the future. I think that the question asked most frequently about space travel is, how will you propel a ship out in space? What will it push against? There's nothing out there for it to uh, push against. You see, the automobile <coughs> obtains its propulsion from the wheels on the pavement. All that the automobile engineer has to do is to shift the gears automatically, get rid of the clutch, and everyone is happy. However, with the airplane, the problem of propulsion is a bit more difficult. You see, there's no street in the sky for wheels to push against. Instead, the airplane must use propellers which create a strong jet of air back and it is the reaction from this jet of air behind the propellers that gives the propulsion to the airplane. Recently aeronautical engineers have developed jet engines which are replacing the older propeller engines. These engines, although they are much more powerful and much lighter and can propel airplanes much faster, work on the same basic principle of propulsion. We have prepared a simple drawing which shows what goes on inside of a jet engine. You see, air is uh, sucked in the front, compressed, mixed with kerosene, burned, and <coughs> shot out the back in a high-speed burning stream. It is the reaction of this high-speed jet out the back 
that gives the propulsion. Let me emphasize again, it is the reaction of this jet that gives the forward push. It is not that the jet is pushing on the air. To understand this, we must remind ourselves of Newton's third law, which says that to every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Let us see how this works. Here is a picture of a boy and his wagon. In this case, the action is for the boy to jump in this direction. The reaction is for the wagon to be sent in this direction. Now, when the boy jumps like that, then the reaction sends the wagon backward. So much for the theory. Let's see what happens in practice. Here I have my son, John. Johnny, we want to show the people uh, how Newton's third law works. Now, what I want you to do is to jump off the wagon, and if Newton is right, then the wagon should get a backward reaction. You ready? Okay. One, two, three, jump. You see, the reaction sent the <coughs> uh, wagon backwards. Next, I want to demonstrate how this action and reaction can be used for propulsion. <coughs> I have here a small cylinder of uh, carbon dioxide used to charge the ordinary seltzer water bottles. It contains gas under high pressure inside, and there's a cap here, which when I puncture it, the gas will shoot out in a high-speed stream, that's our action, and the reaction will be for the cylinder to be sent in the other direction. Now, let's see how this can be used for propulsion. I'm going to put it in our little aeroplane here, like that. And then I'm going to uh, puncture the cap. Now, a rocket works in exactly the same way. Here I have the ordinary 4th of July rocket. It contains powder inside, and when I ignite the <coughs> fuse, the powder will burn and <coughs> send a stream of flames out the back. This stream of flames is our action, and the reaction will be for the rocket to be sent in that direction. Now, we are going to fire a rocket so that you can see this happen. Let's watch while they ignite uh, the 4th of July rocket. You see, the reaction comes from the burning powder gases uh, being sent out behind. Now, Newton's law says that this will happen out in space just the same as it does down here on the Earth. And this is what we use as the basis for propelling rocket ships out in space. <clears throat> Our calculations show that the 4th of July rocket, such as this, is much too weak and too inefficient to be used for a <clears throat> ship that would carry men out beyond the limits of the Earth's atmosphere. Instead, we must have something much more powerful than that. Now, gasoline has much more energy in it than the powder in the rocket. Here I have a bottle of gasoline <coughs> and an ordinary pipe cleaner. And you, you see, <coughs> when I burn the gasoline, I get a rather vigorous flame. Now, here I have a stream of oxygen and you'll, you will notice how much more intense 
the flame was when uh, we had the oxygen on it. This is just the kind of a powerful reaction that we need to uh, have a spaceship uh, go out <clears throat> beyond the Earth's atmosphere. Now, we have a rocket right here in the studio to show you what happens when <clears throat> we put the uh, gasoline and the oxygen into a combustion chamber and have them burning. You see the flames are shooting out in an intense stream that has uh, a great deal of power to it. How would we use this in a spaceship? We have prepared a simple drawing that shows how this would be arranged. First, we would have to have tanks of <coughs> gas, a, first a tank for the gasoline, second a tank for the oxygen, pumps and pipes to carry them to the rocket motor where they meet, burn, and are ejected out behind. We <coughs> the, this action is continuous with the fuel and oxidizer meeting, being ejected out behind. Engineers have developed rockets powerful enough to <coughs> carry missiles up to altitudes of over 100 miles where the air is so rare that there's a molecule here, a molecule there, and another molecule over here. These rockets have reached speeds of 4,000 to 5,000 uh, miles per hour. Now, are these uh, rockets capable of uh, carrying man out into space? The answer is no, they are not. Does this mean that we are going to have to wait many generations to <coughs> be able to travel out into space? Not at all. Engineers have developed what they call a multi-staging. To illustrate that, I have a dummy of a rocket. Supposing that this rocket were fired into space and a small rocket, auxiliary rocket, were carried in the nose. And when the uh, first rocket had achieved its high speed, a <coughs> the second rocket is then fired on, doubling the speed of the first. In this way, with techniques now available, we can send a ship out into space. This is the way the astronautical engineers tell us that we will reach outer space through these multi-stage rockets and we will eventually arrive at and build a space station that will circle and circle and circle the Earth. But we must hold our curiosity for a moment about this space station because we have some questions to answer. Some of these questions concern speed, some fuel, and others the payload that we will carry. Now to a answer these questions, we are fortunate in having the professor of jet propulsion from Princeton University, Dr. Martin Summerfield. Mr. Poole, these questions are indeed important. We must provide answers to them before our designer can begin to work. For the answers we provide determine in a large measure the kind of design he will achieve. Let's take them in order. How fast will this rocket fly? Now, it is well known that it takes a speed of seven miles per second for a body to depart completely from the Earth's gravitational pull and escape, from, uh, escape completely from the Earth. Now, when a, when a space rocket is given this speed by the action of its propulsion system, climbing first slowly through the atmosphere and then reaching its high speed outside of the atmosphere, it will be able to go away from the Earth and be capable of remaining out there indefinitely, never to return. Or, if we wish, we can steer this ship so as to land either upon the moon or upon some nearby planet. Now, seven miles per second is indeed a high speed. In more usual terms, let's put it in miles per hour. Seven times 60, 420 miles per minute. Times 60, second, uh, 60 minutes in an hour gives us 25,200 miles per hour. Now, 25,000 miles per hour is indeed a high speed. An alternative project suggests itself as at least the first step in conquering space. As Mr. Poole suggested, we might place a body in, a, in an orbit 
circulating around the world. In this orbit, the body will behave as a stone at the end of a string. The Earth's gravitational pull substituting for the tension of the string and the centrifugal force holding the body in its path. No additional propulsion energy will be required to maintain this body in its world girdling world flight. And so it will turn around in its flight once every two hours. Now, it takes a high speed, of course, to place the body in this uh, 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 circulating orbit. It has been calculated that a speed of 16,000 miles per hour, less than the 25,000 miles per hour, would be sufficient to bring this body with sufficient energy to uh, continue indefinitely in its circular path. Let us assume that this is the answer we give our designer as to the speed, 16,000 miles per hour. The next question he raised, what propellants shall we use in our space rocket? Now, in the past 30 years, a good deal of research has been carried out on fuels and oxidizers that might be used in liquid rocket engines. I have here two fuels that we might consider. The first, gasoline. Gasoline is a rather ordinary fuel. We're familiar with its properties. And indeed, it could be used in a rocket engine. Now, gasoline, however, is not the most energetic of fuels. There are other compounds that might provide higher energy and consequently be more effective for our purpose. Among these more effective compounds, I have here one, hydrazine. Hydrazine, you can see, is a liquid and it looks like water, but a good deal more hazardous to handle. I wouldn't want it to spill on my skin and I would keep it away from uh, ordinary equipment. Now, hydrazine provides greater energy than gasoline, but of course, because of its hazardous nature, special equipment is required in its handling and loading the rocket. There are more energetic fuels in hydrazine, but these offer even greater hazards or in some cases are more expensive or in other cases are more difficult to manufacture. And so among the large number of compounds that might be chosen, hydrazine stands out as at least one of the, one of the contenders as a fuel for a space rocket. Now, what about oxidizers? Here we have two oxidizers. The first, liquid oxygen. Now, liquid oxygen, of course, is the most natural one we would think of because it is oxygen in the air that supports combustion. Of course, we couldn't carry gaseous oxygen because the tank required to be too large. And so, in liquid form, we have uh, a more convenient uh, 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 form of the oxidizer. But notice this property of liquid oxygen. I pour it into a tin can representative of the tank that might be loaded. It boils away rather vigorously. This limitation of liquid oxygen has suggested to chemists and chemical engineers to search for alternative oxidizers. One such alternative is nitric acid. Nitric acid does not boil away, but of course it is highly corrosive. And so again, we require special equipment to transport and to load nitric acid into the tanks of our rocket. But with such special equipment, taking care to keep it away from skin, from uh, equipment, and from, from instruments, we can successfully use this oxidizer. Now, let us consider this combination for a moment. Hydrazine as a fuel, nitric acid as an oxidizer. This combination offers an interesting property. I can illustrate this property by the simple experiment that I'm going to perform here. Here I have, in a beaker, a small quantity of hydrazine. Here I have below it, in a crucible, a small quantity of nitric acid. I'm going to tip the beaker remotely so as to allow the hydrazine to pour into the nitric acid. Now watch closely what will happen. This is the property I wanted to illustrate. Spontaneous uh, flame upon contact. Now this property of igniting spontaneously is a most useful one because it assures the maintenance of steady combustion, continuous combustion, in our rocket motor. There is no danger now of the rocket flame blowing out and therefore more reliable operation is assured. Now although this is a most useful and quite practical propellant combination, there are others that might be used. Rocket engineers have suggested a number of other practical possibilities. However, for the balance of our discussion, let us assume that this combination is the one for our space rocket. The next question our designer asked, what payload shall our rocket carry? 
We must answer this so that he knows what weight and what space he shall provide. Of course, the first flights out into space will undoubtedly be instrumented, pilotless rocket ships. These will be for the purpose of gathering experience in such flights, and also for the purpose of gathering physical data of, from the high, high reaches of the upper atmosphere and from the regions out in space. But eventually, as we gather experience and as we know more about the, the characteristics of the atmosphere and of space, the first flight piloted will be attempted. And then, when we, know, when we, know, when we have this information, we will be able to tell our designer just what uh, provisions he shall make for crew and cargo. Well, these were the three questions he raised. There are others, of course, that will come up in the course of the design. But bear in mind that today we know several propellant combinations that might be used successfully in the propulsion system of a space rocket. We also know the principles upon which we can base the design of at least the rocket motors of our space rocket. In recent years, several designs have been put forth by rocket engineers of ships that might reach into the outer space. Dr. Von Braun, who will speak to you next week on this program, has proposed a three-stage rocket. I have here a model of it. The lower stage, the middle stage, and the last stage. The last stage carrying in its nose the cabin containing the crew and the equipment. Let us uh, consider this rocket for a moment. Here I have a drawing of it. This drawing is placed alongside of a one-family dwelling to illustrate its towering size. It stands 300 feet high. It measures 65 feet across in the, uh, the, the diameter at the base. It weighs 14 million pounds when loaded with hydrazine and nitric acid. And at the start of its takeoff, it delivers a thrust of 10,000 tons. 10,000 tons is a force sufficient to raise a medium-sized passenger-carrying ocean liner right out of the water. Now let's examine the interior of this rocket, or remove the outer skin to, to show it. Here we have the lower stage. Here we have the middle stage, and then the upper stage. In this upper stage is the cabin. The rocket motors here deliver the starting thrust. Here we have hydrazine, here we have nitric acid, pipes lead the fuel and oxidizer respectively into the rocket motors. When the pilot flips the switch, the rocket motors start to fire, the ship rises from the ground and starts accelerating on its outward flight. Now, after, some, after a couple of minutes of operation, the lower stage has exhausted itself. It no longer serves a useful function. It is cast away. Propulsion is taken over by the middle stage. It delivers its thrust for a couple of minutes, and then it too has served its function, and it is cast away. The final stage, carrying the uh, cabin, containing crew and, and cargo, to the final velocity of 16,000 miles per hour, takes over the job, and our, our propulsion period is complete. Now our, our, our body, now our, our, our spaceship, can continue in its free coasting flight into the circling orbit around the Earth. Let's look for a moment at what our occupants are doing. Here we see the crew reclining in special couches. These couches are intended for support against the force arising from the high acceleration during the firing period. After the firing period, of course, they can uh, leave their couches and move freely about in the cabin, carrying on their duties and uh, taking scientific observations. This, Mr. Poole, is the general type of spaceship that might be used in the first piloted flight out into space. Of course, bear in mind that before this flight can be attempted, there will be many flights of pilotless, instrumented rockets for the purpose of gathering much more experience before we would attempt piloted flight. Standing 24 stories high and weighing thousands and thousands of tons, it's very difficult for us to realize that such a giant can rise from a launching ramp, be forced up through our atmosphere, and careen off into space. Yet we know that one day this will happen, when the engineers have designed the rocket, when they have decided on the exact propellants that they're going to use, when they have built this rocket, when they have put it in their launching ramp, uh, launching ramp and when men are standing about tensely waiting for the final word to launch 
this rocket into space, the world will be looking at them, the world will be wondering how this is going to come about. But when this day comes, around this rocket there will be technicians, there will be all sorts of people working on the preparations. When these have been completed, the first space ship will be standing solidly, ready for its launching. And then the captain of this spaceship will be the last man to enter. He will enter his spaceship, and the doors will be sealed behind him. Everyone will grow tense, tenser, even tenser. And on the ground, men will watch, and then a very calm voice will start counting. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, fire! Fiery and powerful gases from the first unit will rush from the tail of the rocket with a roar heard for miles. Slowly, awkwardly, the rocket will rise from the ground. Then, gathering momentum, it will force its way straight up from the ground with such increased acceleration that within 15 seconds it will have disappeared from sight, leaving only a vapor trail in the sky to mark its path. Rising to a height of more than 30 miles and traveling at a speed of more than 5,000 miles an hour, the automatic pilot will take command and tilt the rocket into its trajectory. Almost at the same instant, the fuel from the tail section, the first stage, will have been consumed. The tail section will be cast off and will parachute back to Earth. Traveling nearly 15,000 miles an hour, the center section will be dropped away, and the third stage will give the rocket its final thrust, which will send it hurtling along its orbital course. Now in its orbit, the rocket will continue to fly around and around the Earth. Only man-made mechanical devices can ever stop the projectile as it hurtles through space. The rocket has entered the dark, vast area we call outer space, the extent of which, the limits of which, no one knows. It is speeding on its way to the space station. The Johns Hopkins Science Review is produced by Lynn Poole in association with Robert Fenwick and Warren Whiteman. Directed by Paul Kane, Associate Director Ed Zero. Art direction is by Barry Mansfield. Your narrator has been Joel Chaseman. Portions of this program have been mechanically reproduced. The Johns Hopkins Science Review originates in the studios of WAAM in Baltimore. This is the Dumont Television Network.